Hi and welcome! In a recent video we have discussed the new jamming features introduced by patch 2.8. Now that we know where and what to look for, let's dive into the angry side and throw some missiles around, shall we? Before that, a brief introduction about the game itself. The game is a fantastic cockpit simulator, an excellent flight simulator, but a poor combat simulator. Now, this is a vast and complex topic, I will write and make a video about it perhaps, but for now let's focus on the basic issues, and the reasons for these will be clear pretty soon. Let's start from the radars. The radar simulation is simplistic at best, and there is no coherent or centralized system to handle variables such as the RCS and aspect and external payloads. A split second in the MSC, and basically any radar is defeated. We saw guidance has seen some recent improvements, but we are still at the beginning. So, for example, an active M54 can revert to SARH, or when the secret cannot find its target, and it's better not talk about the PTSTT guidance. Countermeasures are all of a die with no proper logic. The more you spam them, the better they work. Modern RWRs, except for the 14, are precise down to the minute, whereas there should be a degree of uh, uncertainty on both detection range and direction of aircraft and missiles. This means that aircraft should defend post launch and be proactive rather than over rely on RWR detection just to make a split test and be fine. Moreover, older RWRs should not even be able to detect modern radars either due to the lack of information or sensibility, but I guess this is understandable to even out the gameplay experience. Next, Leak 16 has no drawbacks at all. There is no need to correlate tracks, as they are always put on, and in complex situations, it should require a high degree of diligence and housekeeping from the donors. Jamming, well, jamming is the last row. Uh, burn through range is almost random. The noise jammer we have in DCS behaves like a 360 degrees strobe. It should take a bomber sized aircraft to achieve that, but in DCS, even a MiG 21 can do it. Jamming is so simplistic that none of the features available to the Rio uh, can be implemented, which is kind of sucks, isn't it? The AI is also a big issue. Recent changes make it cheat more rather than be smarter. In fact, it now knows the energy status of a missile while still be able to notch even with the most rudimentary LWR. But this is another can of worms and the plate is already full today. Trust me, the list is still very long and touches many other aspects, comms and air to ground included, but you got the message. Great flight sim, poor game as soon as the aircraft have to interact with any other object. My concern is that some third-party devs are introducing in-house features. For example, jamming or radars. This may lead to discrepancies. A standardized approach to, for example, radar, jamming, RCS uh, on aspect and external payload, for example, should come from a D. Don't get me wrong, I'm not bashing Eagle Dynamics, uh, then on Microsoft, and core features are harder to change without impacting what has been developed so far, than, for example, the graphics. However, I've been playing this game for almost 20 years, and if we include Lomac, and I wish one day we will really achieve uh, their dream. In fact, quoting from DCS's website, they say that our dream is to offer the most authentic and realistic simulation of military aircraft, tanks, ground vehicles and ships possible. Um, we're not there yet. So what is the reason for this very long introduction? Well, because I always aim for realism, and the realistic way to engage in a jamming environment doesn't work. So we have to bend the rules and find a workaround. So I got to a point uh, where the line between float game mechanics and explore does not exist anymore. In fact, the anecdotal evidence say that on the 12th of April 1973, a Phoenix was employed versus a drone simulating a Tupolev 22 equipped with blinking noise jammer. The target was at more than 110 nautical miles when engaged, and the missile passed 5 feet from the target itself. Not too bad, at a distance of 75 nautical miles, and after climbing up to 103,500 feet. Now, what happens when we test this scenario in ECS? Well, if we launch before the jammer is activated, the WCS loves uh, the missile correctly. It then switches to JUT when the jammer is activated and resumes normal radar guidance when it is off. It all seems to work very well, and the TTI is even properly updated. However, the missile is not commanded and basically is trashed. This seems to be a missile issue rather than a WCS issue. 
The example you're watching right now is the closest I got out of a dozen tests using different setups with both the A54C and A. The AI seems to defend for a second, but then you can tell that the missile is not really pointing in the correct direction. So please let me know if you have more luck and manage to score a hit. Anyway, this scenario requires that the target is not jamming when we employ, and if it is, we can fire a Phoenix in Taqua Scan at all. So let's start from the basics. H O J or or more jam. A familiar acronym, uh, it means that the missile goes for the jamming signal emitter. From my understanding, it is not great in real life, but in DCS works pretty good. A missile employed in Oman Jam does not loft. The noise jammer effect prevents the aircraft WCS to determine uh, the range, and if you don't know the range, you can't determine the loft angle or parameters. This is uh, correct in DCS. However, no one said that we cannot manually loft the missile, isn't it? Manual lofting is a concept that goes back to Lomac. Until the recent overhaul of the Phoenix, it was not really necessary. Nowadays, it helps to boost the performance a bit, but the crew must know what they are doing, or they risk to break the guidance by overlofting the missile. However, in Oman Jam, the missile does not loft, but we can make it loft. All we need is to work now on the guidance. Roger that. Since trackwise scan doesn't work, we can only rely on STT. And the plan is simple. Manual loft while in JAT STT, then either rely entirely on Oman Jam, or try to get within burn through range before the impact thus reverting the guidance back to PDSTT, which is quite solid with the C off. Moreover, if the C Phoenix is used, the missile activates the seeker anyway. It shouldn't, but hey, this is DCS doing DCS things again. Using this technique, I have reliably splashed AIs up to 60 nautical miles. Now, is this realistic? Probably not for the 54A. The Phoenix A oh, is wow. de facto a big sparrow. Remember that the Phoenix is a project of the 50s, so it's not particularly modern or brilliant. Perhaps he would have worked for the Phoenix C instead. Now, before the bandwagon of Chitwe Wings pilots AKF-16 and so on start complaining, the AIM-120 AMRAM in this scenario can be manually lofted too. Surprise! The AIM-7 is the only one that doesn't because this has consistency I suppose. I'm joking, of course. Probably. Anyway, back to the Tomcat, the most important variable is the range. Remember, a noise jammer negates the range. You need to find this information somewhere. Range is not only essential uh, for the missile performance. In fact, it is fundamental that the missile is not overlofted. Thus, if you are in the middle of the nose up, ready to launch, and the target switches off the jammer or passes through the burn through range, call it off immunity, or at least is the pool. Otherwise, the WCS will command the loft too, and the missile will go up vertical almost perpendicular to the horizontal vector, with usually more full outcomes. What you have seen so far running is one of my very first tests. Um, the scenario is simple, we commit on a target that appears to be minding its own business, but then it suddenly switches on the jammer and targets us. How do I know that he targeted us? Well, besides the fact that I made the mission myself, the drift rate went down drastically. Point being, against the jamming target, the Rio may need to resort to less intuitive methods of building and maintaining a say. In this test, I used the TCS to assess the range. The Sukhoi 27 was visible, but still jamming. Thus, I determined that the range was between 30 and 40 nautical miles. A few seconds to switch to the front seat, pull up, and I took the shot. As you have seen, the target got closer than the burn through range at some point, and the guidance switched to PDSTT. Let's take a look at another example using the same setup. In this case, I had the ND Link 4A data link active and obtaining the range is straightforward. 
I find that disabling the gem strobes help to declutter and better, better monitor the range. Otherwise, the symbology overlaps to the 20 nautical miles markings on the TAD. I aim to employ it circa 45 nautical miles. As before, I pulled, tossed, and cranked. I am using the target's reaction and maneuvers to understand whether it is defending or not. And as soon as it turned, I set up the Tomcat for a follow up shot. Unfortunately, Asman is not really reactive, and the ability of performing our tours is quite needed. Example number three, same scenario, but in this case I messed up. More news at five. This example is meaningful because it shows what happens when the target becomes clear right before launching. The bell drawn by the M54 may look good, but it's a ton of wasted energy. We don't want a mortar, we want a long range howitzer. Copy. Firstly, the F-16 decided to take a non om jam shot, so right after entering his burnt through range, I disabled my jammer. This caused the MRAM to lose me. I'm on it. Copy. The rest is quite funny, I struggled a lot with Asman, but I did maintain good awareness and managed to take a shot in the turn. The Fighting Falcon defended again, and to seal the deal I launched the name Simon Sparrow.
A nanosecond before dying, the F-16 managed to launch an M120. Even at this range, a simple split has, without any sort of chaffs, defeated the Amram kinetically. And if you're wondering why I did not use any chaffs, it's because I haven't assigned them anywhere. Uh, this tells you how often I sit in the front seat. As mentioned already, the overloft causes this silly trajectory. Not only the energy is wasted in a steep climb, but the trade is not worth it anymore, both in terms of speed in the dive and neither in the horizontal plane. And by the way, better not ask any former F-14 crew how realistic this is. Example number 4, again against an F-16, and again, I did not splash it at the first shot, but nevertheless, the ability of employing a long range allows the Tomcat crew to impose their initiative and gain an immediate advantage. Since the dynamics are similar to the previous example, I skip directly to tag view. Note how, when properly employed, the trajectory of the M54 is nowhere near as silly as the previous. Assuming someone is still watching, this is example number 5, the last one. Congrats, you made it! This time, against an F-16C. This example shows the longest kill of the batch, with an employment range of 16 nautical miles, which becomes around 55, taking account the LTE. With a bit of practice and luck, you can kill the AI way further than that. What is curious here is that the target barely defended, possibly because I passed this burn through range only a few seconds before April. Nevertheless, job done, target kill.
And that's it for this video. I hope you have found it useful. There is still a lot to say about the Tomcat. So see you next time here or on the website. Take care.